Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Snowman Logistics Limited Q2 FY23 earnings conference call. We have with us on this call Mr. Ishan Gupta, Director, Mr. Sambhad Gupta, Director, Mr. Sunil Nair, CEO, Whole Time Director, Mr. Balakrishna N, Financial Controller, Mr. Kiran George, Company Secretary. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchtone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Ishan Gupta. Director, Snowman Logistics Limited. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome to our Q2 FY23 earnings conference call. I hope you all had the chance to peruse our financial statements and earnings presentation that are already made available on the exchanges and our website. Uh, before we start the Q&A, I would like to give you an overview of the company and some of our recent activities. Uh, Snowman is India's leading logistics service provider in the temperature control warehousing and distribution space. We have a large network of 41 warehouses spread across 17 cities, having a total capacity of 130,000 pallets. And uh, currently we are operating a fleet of over 500 refrigerated vehicles. Apart from our regular warehousing and transportation activities, we are happy to announce the launch of our fifth party logistics services, or 5PL services. Uh, we've become India's first uh, cold chain com company to offer end-to-end -end solutions to our customers in this regard, ranging from procurement, sourcing, warehousing, distribution, inventory management, quality control, and a host of other value-added services. This is a natural shift for a company like ours in line with global practices in the industry, and it helps our customers with creating a more efficient supply uh, supply chain so that they can focus on their core business. These services also help increase customer stickiness and give the rise in the revenue and profit for our company. We started offering 5PL services only in the last quarter and currently our customers include IKEA, Baskin Robbins and Tim Hortons. We are very optimistic of increasing this line of business in the time to come. Another significant inclusion to our infrastructure during the quarter is the addition of a warehouse in Hyderabad. Uh, of 26,000 uh, square feet with a pallet capacity of 1,200, having six docks. We have been growing our presence in dry warehousing for meeting the requirements of our existing customers as well as new clients. Uh, and also we are continuing with our dedicated warehousing which we offer for you e-commerce services, e-commerce customers. Going ahead, we plan to continue exploring expansion opportunities in all these areas, which includes temperature control warehousing, dry warehousing, and the new distribution model. On the transportation side, uh, while we have our own fleet, we are expanding rapidly through Snowlink, which is our tech platform for aggregating uh, refrigerated fleet across the country. Um, so with that, we would like to open the Q&A session and feel free to ask us anything which you'd like about any of those activities. Operator, over to you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin with the question and answer session. Anyone wishing to ask a question, may please press star in one on your touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself in the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question case assembles. First question is from the line of Sudanshu from Arunova. Please go ahead. Um, hi. So the company has started reporting a new segment called Trading Attribution. And from the first quarter that this is being reported, it's contributing 8% of the rest. So I'd like to uh, 
of these revenues what kind of business is it exactly that i mr fazan ji your audio is breaking up um sorry so i was saying that the company has started reporting a new segment called trading and distribution and from the first quarter of reporting it's contributing 25% of the revenues so could the management provide some clarity around the nature of these revenues so what kind of business is it exactly and how is it you know kind of scaled up so significantly from the first quarter itself yeah hi uh, sudanshu this is sunil nayar uh this is this trading and distribution business comes under our ipl service offering wherein uh, as ishan mentioned we do right from sourcing to distribution end to end solution where we develop vendors we do quality audits we negotiate with them we buy inventory from them and then we sell it to our potential customers uh that is when we are a sourcing partner in case of selling uh, the things we also provide sales support to the product if the customer wants to distribute finished product finished product to their uh, uh, distribution so in this the inventory is held to our host so it's typically a trading business that, that that's where the trading and distribution revenue has come which includes our service income as well as the uh, uh, cost of goods which are uh, distributed okay and so what proportion of this revenue is the service income and what proportion is the cost of goods you know that is being routed through the books so the uh, 10% of this is uh, service income and 90% is uh, cost of goods 90% is is cost of goods and uh, i mean you know trading is quite a risky and volatile business so uh, how do you take a call when you want to hold inventory or or how you want to increase or decrease your in- inventory levels because that could also lead to trading you know profits or losses and that could introduce more volatility in the in the earnings so could you shed some light on that please so the arrangement is complete end to end from supplier to the customer we have tied it uh, to the uh agreement which clearly states that we will buy against the projections from the customer and uh, they will uh, have to buy that much quantity against their projection uh in in case of overall city that we have today with these three customers almost 50% of them are just in time the day we buy it, the same day we sell as well so yes there is a, a risk associated with this but we Uh, have uh, covered that to various terms and conditions, and at the same time, we are doing business only where there is very less of uh, seasonality or uh, up and downs in the sales and uh, requirement of our customer. Right. Okay. And what would be the you know kind of strategy to scale up and grow the trading and distribution business? Who do you see as your competitors in this space? so for the type of service that we are offering which includes typically the five year where sourcing and vendor development services there is no other uh, 3pl or cold chain company which is offering this service so we don't find a uh, direct competition but there are many distribution companies so from the distribution point of view yes there is competition uh, we potential here we take this as one of the uh, maybe in a in couple of years time this will be one of the biggest uh, vertical for a segment for a uh because today uh, the amount of goods that we are distributing under 3pl agreement is close to 12 to 15000 crores um uh, 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 worth of material is moved and our our intent is to uh, move these cu- customers into a 5pl uh, uh, service offering okay so but distribution seems like a completely new business uh, you know business vertical from cold chain warehousing which has been snowman's historical strength so what is your competitive advantage in distribution no so if you see we are we are doing the same thing you know uh, this this five year also comes as an attractive business proposition because the warehousing and transportation is the base here okay so the additional of additional services are just an extension of those uh 3 year activities that we have been doing and we all these customers who are now onboarded are our three, were our previous customers 
and they saw uh, a better integration and uh, we taking more responsibility from their supply chain team and executing that is what the customer looks at it uh, uh, and we are also looking at that that from their supply chain spend we get a, a larger uh, pie of share. So it is a win-win uh, as we move forward multiple customers of same segments would be able to uh, get a better pricing because of we doing consolidated buying for them. If there are 4 or 5 USR customers on board it, we can do a consolidated buying from uh, various manufacturing companies and, and the bulk quantity would always give us, us a better price. Which is win-win for the manufacturer, for us as uh, the uh, distribution company and as well as to the customer. So uh, that, 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 that aspect is uh, taken care of. Okay, and uh, you mentioned that the inventory is purchased on projection, and if those projections are not met, so do we still have to, because we've bought the inventory, so we would still have to end up holding it, right? Yes, we have to still uh, hold it. Uh, the risk uh, that in this business typically you face is the expiry risk, because most of it is food, but that risk is with the customers because it is bought against their projection. But, but let's say that the projection is not met, then what happens to these goods? Do they, would they have to be written down on our books or what are the safety nets in place that we have if the projections are not met? If the projections are not met, the products have to be disposed of or uh, the customer will sell it on a, a promotion. Uh, all, all the costs, either whether it is disposed of, return to supplier or uh, promotion uh, with uh, offering channels will all be to the customer's uh, account. And, and what would be the order pipeline for the segment trading and distribution? Are there any other contracts uh, that are under negotiation? Yes, there are. Okay. And can we expect any announcements in the next few quarters or it's more long term? Uh, it depends, you know, how, how fast the customer wants to switch. Typically, these are these have triggers, you know, usually people, customers would like to change when their year ends or year beginning. So if it is a multinational company uh, where uh, the year begins from first, then maybe we'll be able to have something, some news in the coming part. If it is Indian company from first April, there will be changeover. So it all depends on which one uh, gets to and when. Okay, right. And just one last question probably. So you mentioned that you don't have competitors on the 5PL side, which is both, which is all three, warehousing, transportation, and distribution. But you have a lot of competition on the distribution side. So, you know, probably how do, uh, I mean, how do you kind of stand out from the, from the companies on the food distribution side? What advantage do we have? Uh, Sudhanshu Ishan here. One major advantage uh, which we have over the competition is that we are giving a bundle. Like Sunil said, our base is warehousing and transportation. So uh, compared to a pure distributor or a pure cold chain supplier, we are able to offer all these services in a single platform. So apart from like, like you were mentioning how soon do we plan to build this up further, apart from uh, existing from 3PL to 5PL, uh, there is a huge opportunity of new brands and new QSRs specifically entering India. Uh, one example is that out of the three who we have started with, IKEA, Baskin, and Tim, uh, Tim Hortons, Tim Hortons is a recent brand uh, from Canada which has just entered India. And from the beginning, we have partnered with them, and wherever they go, we'll be growing along with them. They are just one company, and they have ex very ag aggressive plans for opening all over India. So like that, if any new uh, uh, chain wants to enter India, for example, uh, the advantage that we'll have over a pure distributor is that they'll be speaking to us for cold uh, storage anyway. So we can offer them the full package. Okay, okay. Okay, uh, thank you. I, I, I mean, I don't have any further questions. Congratulations on these numbers. And uh, and it would be interesting to kind of see how the how the new segment plays out. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sudanshu. Thank you. A reminder to the participants, anyone wishing to ask a question, may I please press star in one.
participants in the conference, if you wish to ask a question, you may please press star and one. The next question is from the line of Kashagra from Old Bridge Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi team. Thanks for the opportunity uh, and uh, congrats on a uh, good set of numbers. A uh, few questions. Uh, so basically to understand uh, this uh, 5 PL business more, uh, can you can you help us picturize or probably take an example, for example, IKEA, uh, uh, you know, versus the traditional services of 3 PL, uh, what incrementally you would be doing for IKEA? what commodity uh, probably you would be uh, doing it for them. So just to picturize, help us picturize this. Uh, yeah, sure. So, Sandra, what we do is typically a distribution company or a 3 company would do the primary transportation, warehousing, and the secondary transportation. These are the typical service offerings. What we do under 5 offering to them is, let's take an example of they, they need an ice cream cone. Now they would say that, you know, I'm, I want to sell ice cream in cones now, so can you help me with buying ice cream cones? And then we go and find out ice cream cone manufacturers in the country. We do quality audit of their facilities to see that all food safety norms are followed. We take quotation specification of the product. We collect samples, we go, go and give it to the product development team of IKEA. They check the product, they, they identify two or three options. They give it back to us, we go back, we do the commercials with those uh, manufacturers and we do a recommendation to IKEA saying that okay, these three we validated and from, a launch, from various assessment, technical assessment of the supplier, their financial condition, their track record, everything put together, we recommend to buy it from this and this supplier. Once that is identified and they approve it, then we buy that product and supply to IKEA under two arrangements, one we, we have a service charge for doing the role sourcing and vendor development activity. Second is we have a distribution markup and margin on this whole trading business. So this is the typical arrangement. Got it. That is quite helpful. So just to understand the way you report, uh, uh, right now you said 10% is the services component and 90%. And if I look at that 10% is actually your gross profit from uh, from that business. So basically, uh, had you not reported the inventory or not taken the inventory on your books, uh, probably the revenue uh, which you would have reported otherwise would have been that gross profit, which is the services component, which is the 10% uh, of the goods which you which you are mentioning, right? Uh, no, it won't be even 10% then because this 10% is into our uh, service charges for the sourcing and all, and also the trading margin. So it would be uh, lesser than that if it is not IPM service. Okay, uh, got it. So then, uh, uh, I mean, if you can give some more color as to generally what are the broad trading margins and then second, uh, if I look only the gross profit of that and if I compare, uh, you know, uh, uh, the EBIT portion of it, that comes to, that comes out to be a significantly high margin business for you guys, this particular business. So, though it looks a little bit margin dilutive because of the higher inventory which you are booking, but overall it's probably adding you or giving you some more cash flows uh, uh, because of the value added services which you guys are providing. Yeah, you are absolutely right. So, see, if you take a generic distribution business where you do the physical services, primary transportation, storage, secondary transportation, in a matured uh, case, you know, we would be 6 to 10 percent of our uh, customer's uh, cost. Uh, so, we are taking that to 10 percent. So, definitely this is going to be the higher margin, higher uh, cash flow business as we move forward as compared to our earlier business model. Um, the important, is to, sorry, sorry. No, the important is to understand that this is, uh, we, we are looking at it as an incremental opportunity from the infrastructure which is already created. So instead of doing a business with that revenue and that margin, we have opportunity to have uh, the same, same infrastructure used to create better revenue and better margin and that's the whole uh, intent behind this uh, distribution business model. Um, Kushagra Ishan here. 
just to add to that a little bit more from more from a strategic point of view rather than specifics uh the reason one of the reasons why we entered this business is not only for the you know uh, additional revenue or uh, you know increasing the throughput of the company uh but more importantly on absolute terms like you said uh ebitda also our cash flows you know, benefit from this so as a percentage it might look lower uh, it, it definitely will look lower but as an absolute number it's increasing at the same time uh the customers are getting sticky so once someone again i'll take the example of you know right now the three customers who we have any one of them if they want to migrate to someone else uh, offering the same services they have zero options available in india uh, because we are giving them this whole package end to end uh, going ahead apart from these specific customers requirements of sourcing once we have a base of a few more customers we will have negotiation power from the buying side as also so uh, hypothetically speaking say tissue paper for example if a bunch of restaurants need tissue paper and we are already doing storage and transportation for them uh we can source tissue paper to, at a larger volume and then sell to each of our individual customers uh, and increase our trading margins out there so those kind of possibilities will come in and over time in in the developed part of the world uh this is the model that cold chain and food companies are operating in uh so snowman will transition from a warehousing and transportation company to a food services or a food distribution company in the time to come got it got it ishan that's uh, that's quite a exhaustive answer thanks for that few more questions uh, on on your on on your traditional uh, i mean uh, 3pl business which you're doing uh, so when you say uh, you're expanding it asset like right uh, can you can you give some more color as to uh, how you do it i mean is it largely on the leases right and going forward uh, if you can give some sense on the quantity of expansions from dry pellets and cold storage so probably right now dry would be around 20000 25000 out of those total 130000 but going forward as you move towards 2 lakh 2 lakh 30 2 50000 pellets uh, what proportion you are seeing coming from the dry ones overall Uh, yeah, uh, so you are right. Uh, three years back, we had some strategies on uh, going little asset light, and we started with the transportation, where we created this moving platform, and uh, we started leasing trucks. Today, we, uh, on an average, lease anywhere between 150 to 200 trucks on a daily basis. Uh, coming to Bahrain, we started leasing dry warehouses. Wherever we have cold storage, and we have same customer waiting dry. Uh, space we we started leasing next to our existing corporate facilities and that's where we started and now we are also going into leasing larger independent dry warehouses and offering uh, dry logistics service to food and near food uh, segments. So uh, yeah, as of now, our dry capacity is around 18 percent. Uh, a year back, it, it was 15 percent. and we believe that uh, in a year time it should go up to almost 25 26% uh, dry contribution in overall uh, uh, capacity that we have does that answer your question yes and generally you sort of uh, go out and scout for independent warehouses and uh, get them on lease right yes so so far we were doing it on a back to back basis where we already have demand and hence we have to go for Uh, a dry space. Now we may also go for leasing the dry space, and then uh, at the same time looking for customers. Uh, sure, sure. So, okay, got it. So there is uh, uh, a significant expansion in the dry pellets. Can you give some more color uh, as to uh, what sort of goods get stored? Uh, I mean, how different would this business be versus the cold storage, both in terms of your margins uh, uh, as well as the realizations? Broad color will be helpful. so uh, see each warehouse would be different but on a on a plain vanilla basis if i lease a dry warehouse and without much modification in it if i further uh, lease it to customers and start offering services uh, we uh, get uh, anywhere around 13 to 15% margin there uh, so that that yeah so that's the uh, thumb rule that we have 
uh, and the lease would typically be anywhere between uh, six to nine years uh, lease, both ways. And there are other models where we have to put some infrastructure within the warehouse where the racking and all those things uh, are done. In that case, it works out to be around 20-22% EBITDA uh, uh, with a, uh, a PVP of around 10%. Uh, sure. No. Uh, what what I was trying to get uh, from you is, uh, I mean, uh, given there would be some differences between the goods which you will deal in the dry and uh, the cold storage. Uh, if you can give broad color as to what sort of goods get stored uh, 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 in in the dry segment, and also, uh, I mean, cold storage. We totally understand the way you guys have differentiated in terms of quality, in terms of delivery, and all those sort of things. But dry there would already be a lot of lot of inventory or lot of capacities in the market so i'm just trying to figure out how you guys sort of differentiate in that particular segment okay so dry you know, one important thing that we should keep in mind is we are still focusing on food as a category and our differentiation primarily comes from uh, ensuring the FSSI compliance on the ground where there are a lot of complications right from the people health check up every six months to the upkeep of the warehouse to the uh, track uh, documentation traceability records and all those things so that is our differentiation in the market and typically the products are uh, you can say fmcg products are one chemical products are also something which we uh, store so the ones which don't need temperature control but need all other care uh, from uh, the compliance point of view is what we are uh, looking at. So we don't want to do a generic warehousing which other retail services offer. We want to do where there is some complexity in terms of compliance documentation is in place and that's our strength uh, uh, due to our experience in cold chain and food products. Got it, sure. Just one last question from my side. Uh, uh, if you can give uh, uh, broadly, what would be you know the fixed cost in the business? Let's say, considering the power, I mean the electricity, the manpower uh, at this point of time. And once you change and shift more towards asset light, uh, your, the rentals uh, which you would be signing would also be a component of your fixed cost. So, just broadly, if you can uh, you know uh, give some some numbers around that. Uh, it's very difficult because each vertical has a different uh, uh, ratio of fixed and variable. Yeah. Uh, I can roughly tell you that in case of my snow preserve business, which is warehousing business, our fixed cost uh, comes to somewhere around 600 rupees per pallet. That is an average of frozen chilled and dry. So it's, it's difficult to uh, you know quantify this at a business level. Ha, okay. Sure, uh, sure, no worries. Uh, this was uh, quite helpful. Uh, thanks a lot, guys, and uh, all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. A reminder to the participants, anyone wishing to ask a question, may please press star in one. The next question is on the line of Rohit from Progressive Shares. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Sunil and team. A uh, couple of questions uh, related to uh, the 5PL business and the other aspects of the operations. Uh, firstly, uh, you did touch up on uh, some of the risks which are associated and, and, and there are certain uh, terms and conditions related to that. Uh, but what sort of uh, 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 special certifications or compliance uh, requirements are there for 5PL business? Since you are looking at uh, vendor sourcing as well as vendor development, and in addition to that, you are looking at quality inspection also. So, so are there any uh, special uh, certifications required for this business? So, Rohit, uh, for us as an entity, there is no special certification required. All what is required is in place in terms of warehousing and transportation, whether mm -hmm. you talk about FSSA license or DRC. Uh, the certification or ISO 22000, those are in place anyway. But yes, when we are auditing the manufacturer, we have to uh, ensure that all, whether it is a food processing or uh, the special requirements related to each product, 
uh, whether they are, they are complying to that or not. So this is part of our audit process where we check at the manufacturer level. For us as Chromex, we don't have to go for any special licensing requirement. Uh, okay. Okay, so in addition to the uh, stickiness of the customers, which uh, some of them are already with us, uh, uh, what is the other factor that will differentiate you from the competition then? Because uh, if somebody has a client base, then he can also start up with the uh, five year services, right? Right. You are right. If someone is already with us, then we can always start this uh, thing. The, the differentiation that we have is the amount of uh, client base that we have yeah. and mm -hmm. some of the some of the clients that our clients are actually suppliers to our other clients. So they are storing in our warehouse only. So when, when I have the supplier and the customer meeting in my warehouse. So mm -hmm. that is the uh, one major benefit that we have found. So when we are doing the buying and selling, we can say, uh, we are doing just in time without holding any inventory. It is basically moving stock from one chamber to another chamber. So, uh, so this is one spend. Second step is uh, uh, all our target customers. In each segment, we have good amounts of different customers which are stored and operated from a single facility. So when I consolidate over a period of time their volume and go back and negotiate with the uh, suppliers, we would have much, much larger volume for negotiation. And uh, that would uh, differentiate in the market uh, very clearly. Okay. Okay. Uh, my next question is uh, related to the uh, CAPEX plan that we had. Uh, earlier you had indicated that somewhere around 75 to 100 crore was planned over the next two years. So uh, are you still continuing with the plan or, or are you trying to become more aggressive or is there some letdown on these uh, CAPEX plans that you had? We are still with that plan. Uh, as we said, 75 to 100 crore in uh, 12 to 18 months, we are still on that. This quarter we'll decide about uh, Calcutta, which uh, where the land is already purchased. We mm -hmm. are also leasing some dry warehouses where we may have to do some fit outs for our customers. So this 75 to 100 crore in uh, 12 to 18 months is still on. Okay. And if you can take us through the uh, progress on the expansion plans for uh, one, Kolkata, uh, two, Pune and uh, three Hyderabad, which you have also mentioned in the PPT as well. Yes, so Pune and Hyderabad are existing facilities where uh, we have some small portion of land where we are expanding. Calcutta is a greenfield uh, project, which will be close to 10,000 pallet positions built in two phases of 5,000 each. And we will be having some dry warehouses at uh, uh, Tauru and uh, which is Haryana and one in Bangalore where we'll be doing some pick outs and uh, for a specific customer. Mm -hmm. And in terms of uh, capacity utilization of Siliguri, have you been able to scale it up from 35-40% uh, or, or is it still the same? Yes, we are at 55% now. Okay. And uh, with the business pipeline, which by December end, we should be somewhere around 75%. Okay. Okay. Number two is at 85%. Okay. So, uh, Sunil, in terms of uh, 5 years and, and the uh, requirement for probably the uh, capacity or the shares that a 5 year business might require, uh, can, you, can you take us to uh, how will you differentiate since we have one part of business which is having dedicated uh, storage uh, client based strategy and, and now we are having uh, uh, this business where we are looking at vendor sourcing and development. How will you manage uh, the capacity requirement of IPL then? If it has to scale very high, which appears that it is growing at 25%, uh, how will you kind of uh, have the capacity for IPL then? So see, two things here. One is, as I said, uh, our first focus is to convert our three tier customers into five years. Mm -hmm. So that's what we are doing. That typically means that I may not add much of the, uh, uh, I may not need much of the storage and transportation. It's already happening under 3 I am only moving it to a 5 year account where I help my customer in terms of sourcing, vendor negotiation, vendor identification, and you know, uh, allied activities. Mm -hmm. So if I am today 5 6 of their uh, cost, I will become 9 percent of their cost. But I'm also, they are outsourcing all these activities to us. That's, that's point number one. 
Point number two, in case of uh, more 5PL accounts, uh, 5PL services attracting newer accounts, yes, we will need space and that's why this expansion that we are planning uh, uh, in terms of Calcutta and other places. Uh, in our customer segments and the 3PL, there are three categories, A, B, C, A is where we get the premium yield per pallet or premium uh, yield per kilometer, C category where we get lease. So this C category will get replaced with the 5PL customers wherever we get it. So that our yield from per pallet improves. Awesome. Okay. Okay, in uh, terms of the uh, addition of uh, PPE of uh, some uh, 7.34 crore uh, uh, during the first half, if you can take us to where is this expansion happening, uh, which which city are you targeting? Uh, sorry, come again, which uh, there's some plant and equipment uh, addition that has happened, 7.34 crores. Uh, no, that is not for expansion, that is regular capex that we enjoy oh, okay. in terms of replacing some equipment. Oh, okay. 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 So, so uh, Sunil, you had guided in the past that you will be looking at uh, some 20-25% kind of top line growth and and with the uh, uh, 5PL growing at uh, the same rate, uh, do you think that you want to revise your guidance uh, for the top line growth? We will uh, look at it as of now, we are still forming up our next three years plan. So maybe we will be able to uh, share some thoughts on that in the next quarter. Okay, okay, fair. Uh, and lastly, uh, with the uh, EBITDA margin, the blended ones I'm asking, uh, we have come to a range of like uh, 2023 uh, kind of a, a range in EBITDA margin. So you think that this will be uh, sustainable and we should be working with this number going forward? The blended uh, margins, EBITDA margins is what I'm asking. So if we see individually uh, the warehousing and transportation, it is it is it is growing. Uh, it is it is one percent up uh, as compared to uh, last year in percentage terms. And uh, if as as the slow distribute business, the distribution and trading business goes up, the overall weightage percentage will will come down because of the cost delay. Uh, but in terms of individual line items, it is it will continue to grow. So should we revise it to somewhere like 26 percent or 28, which was historic uh, EBITDA margins in the past, which we have seen uh, three years or four years ago? No, so see, uh, without trading business, uh, hmm. even now it would be somewhere around that 27 percent. So I am saying with more of trading business, the percentage will keep coming down because the contribution of uh, trading top line is higher as compared to EBITDA. EBITDA there is what 10 percent, right? Okay. So 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 the percentage will go down. What we are looking at is how the absolute EBITDA uh, keeps going up. So from last quarter's uh, uh, 21 crore of EBITDA, we went to 24 crore of EBITDA. Uh, with uh, similar 3PL business, but with the 5PL services. So we are looking at that as an objective that our EBITDA in terms of absolute number is going up. Mm -hmm. Okay. And anything, any thoughts on the uh, comfortable debt equity or uh, comfortable debt that you will be uh, peaking out at? So when we do this expansion of Concerta uh, uh, and uh, now, uh, other two, three expansions, we would be doing uh, around uh, 75-25 uh, debt equity. But at the same time, uh, I wrote Ashan, you know, we are also repaying uh, debts as and when they, they are due. So, uh, in Snowman, we will follow a similar strategy which we follow in Gateway, that uh, net debt to equity, uh, EBITDA, and net debt to EBITDA uh, will uh, keep it as not more than one. Okay. Maximum 1.2 going ahead as, as these new projects come in. In, in terms of rupees crore, uh, uh, what is the uh, debt which is there as uh, at the end of half year? 100 and yeah. Uh, sorry, sir, we are not audible. Can you hear a bit loud? Hundred and fourteen crore. Yeah, crore. Crore. I mean, that is ninety-four crore. Hundred and fourteen crore, is it? Did I hear that well? Yeah, 
Uh, okay, Sunil Nishan. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, all the very best for the new endeavors that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Thank you. The next question is on the line of Rachita from IELTS. Also, we would like to remind participants that you may press star and want to ask a question. Rachita, uh, you may please proceed. Yes. Uh, hello. Good evening, sir. Uh, so, sir, most of my questions are answered. Uh, just one or two questions that I had in mind. One was on the growth part. Uh, so, the prior uh, participant mentioned that you were uh, expecting a growth of 30%. So, is this guidance for this year or the coming uh, uh, two, three years, the guidance that you had given? So, uh, the so uh, this was 25% projection as compared to last year versus this year's budget, mm. this financial year. And uh, on a YTD basis, we are at 44% now. So he was suggesting whether you would like to revise your numbers for the rest of the year. Yes, sir, because right now, uh, you know, the run rate has increased. So considering yes. that, uh, uh, would you like to, uh, you know, change the guidance or anything we, as such? We will be changing the guidance, but uh, not at this point because this was, uh, you know, this new business has been very recent, only in the last quarter. And we are seeing traction now. We will be building more customers. So uh, right now we won't feel comfortable putting a number to it, but we will share that with you once we have done our internal calculations. Okay, and uh, will we be able to maintain this, uh, you know, top line growth in the coming two to three years, like a 20-25% growth? Yeah, yes. we, in fact, we, we are quite confident that it will be higher than that uh, at the top line level. Uh, again, because we'll be adding on and building on to this 5 year business in a very big way. Uh, and then with our other expansions, are. Uh, traditional 3PL model will also continue growing. Okay, okay. And on the uh, uh, 5PL that you started, uh, I missed on the point. So what are the risks involved in this business? So see, in, in general, when, when we are doing this business, uh, we have the risk of uh, over-inventory is there always. The, the the risk of in case of food products, the risk of expiry is there. But so far, uh, with all the accounts that we are dealing with, we have back to back arrangement where the procurement is done against the projection given by the customer. And if they don't uh, uh, lift uh, stock as per their projection, the responsibility of expiry is done. So, see, so far, we have uh, you know protected ourselves from the risk. But as we move forward uh, and when we start scaling, we will have to revisit the whole uh, arrangement and uh, see how we can deal with that. Okay. So, sir, so I'm understanding it right. Uh, you, uh, the inventory that you buy, so if the end consumer, uh, the one who you're selling it to, if they do not buy it, you will have to bear the expenses. That is general thing. As of now, the free accounts that we have, if they have to buy it compulsorily as per their projection. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, and uh, right now, so the EBITDA margins are at around 21%, which I understand is because of the new business that you've started with. So this 21%, is this sustainable or it will fall further? So if the distribution business would have where the inventory is in our books, the percentage may go down. But in absolute terms, it will look much, much better. So any range that you can uh, basically help us with, like uh, between what range can we expect this EBITDA margin to be? Sorry, come again. Uh, any range that you can uh, suggest for these EBITDA margins, like uh, below uh, a certain point it won't fall, like anything like that, if you could just uh, throw some light on that. No, see, basically it will depend on the mix of warehousing, transportation and the distribution business. Uh, our warehousing business today is at around 35 to 37 percent. It will remain at that percent or do, or do slightly better. Uh, 
Our transportation is around 6 to 7 percent. It will remain at that 6 to 7 percent. It will not go down. Distribution business is at 10 percent. We will have to see uh, uh, at a vital level distribution business is at uh, 5 percent. Uh, if that contribution in the overall revenue increases, then it will pull down the overall percentage average. But from an individual line item, they will, they will all do same or better. So it will depend on completely the mix that comes in further quarter, uh, which will drive the uh, blended percentage. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kushagra from Oldbridge Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, thanks for the follow up. Just two questions. One, uh, last time you sort of mentioned that, you know, uh, for the overall industry, the demand supply dynamics is uh, in your favor and hence um, there are five to six percent price increases, right? I just want to pick your thoughts on as to uh, how this, how is the situation now? Uh, are there more uh, capacities coming in, more capital chasing the sector or broad, broad color will be helpful over there? The situation is more or less same with, with an increase of you know, uh, 12 to 15% volume from our customer side. If we see a comparable capacity increase in the country, it has not been much, just a couple of facilities are being built as of now. So uh, the situation continues. We have commanded a 5.5% price increase this year. Uh, and uh, as we start negotiating uh, from Jan onwards, no full that similar price increase we will be able to. Uh, get in the next year also. Uh, sure, got it. And last one, so basically uh, in a lease versus uh, fully owned model, uh, let's say you earn, you know, 1400, around 1400 revenue per pallet, right, on an average, including, I mean, on an aggregate basis. So on that, uh, uh, what would be the component of lease, which probably because you will not own the assets, which will expand your ROC, but uh, there will be uh, cash outflow in the form of leases or rentals. So just trying to get a sense on 1400 rupees revenue per pallet, what would be uh, an equivalent per pallet uh, uh, lease outflow on that broadly? So see, the, the yield per pallet uh, is, is same irrespective of whether it is owned or leased, because the quality of infra is same, service offering is same. So from revenue point of view, they are saying mostly the these ones are dry wear on this. So if you categorize frozen, chilled and dry, if you make three categories, then frozen typically would be somewhere around 1650, 1700 rupees per pallet. Chilled would be somewhere around 200, 1200 to 1300 per pallet. And dry would be somewhere around 750 to 800. So uh, dry is what we are leasing most of the cases. Frozen and chilled mostly are Almost 97, 98% are in our own warehouse. Right. So on that uh, 600, uh, what would be the component of leases? I mean, around 10% of it, uh, 10, 12, 15? No, you are saying that dry, dry is, so say 800 rupees is my rental revenue. You are saying out of that, how much is the uh, rental paid to the landlord? Yeah. So I'm just trying to compare because you would not be, uh, 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 I mean, doing the capex for owing, owing the asset, uh, there will be certain outflows in the form of rentals and the leases. So just trying to figure out what it would be as a percentage of your revenue per pallet. Well, average around uh, 25% is the rental, lease rental. 20%, 29%. 25%. Okay, got it. Uh, thanks, Lord Sunil. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks guys, all the best. Thank, Thank you. you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question. On behalf of Snowman Logistics Limited, that concludes this conference call. We thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines. Thank you.